imagine this. You're a new agricultural researcher going into a Southeast Asian country. Never been there before. You've landed, been, at, been met at the airport, dropped in the hotel, said we'll pick you up first thing in the morning. You've looked out the window and you've seen authentic Italian cuisine. You've seen an Italian restaurant next door. You've got a little bit of Italian heritage in you, as, all, as a lot of good Australians have. And you think, oh, my nonna used to make beautiful lasagna. I wonder if they make lasagna. I might duck next door and have a, had my first meal uh, in this country of lasagna. Mm. Um, you sit down, you hear the um, kitchen going out the back, they really, really sounds Italian. You put it at a table, you get your glass of water, and the waiter gives you a set of chopsticks. <laughs> out comes the lasagna in a beautiful, steaming, smells fantastic, and there's chopsticks. And you think, hmm, how am I going to do this? You don't actually know very much about using chopsticks. You've used them a couple of times in the local Chinese back home. But that's it. You go to pick up your first piece of lasagna and it goes gloop straight in between. And you go, holy dooly. What am I going to do? But you battle on. You do it. You use your chopsticks, you use the technology that you've got, and you battle on to carry it out. Sometimes you think, oh wow, I wish I had a bigger peg. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a little bit about how people feel when they're using information technology for the first time. They see the need, they see the use, they want to do good research, they want to do it, but they can't communicate as well because they don't know how to use the technologies. Or they're not up with, they haven't been trained in that technology, they're not used to what it can be used for. This is what my research was about. One thing um, I had to um, find is firstly a model for how people actually communicate together, particularly when we come from different cultures, we're coming from different experiences, we're coming from different education systems, and then what we use to try and communicate to each other and whether that's really appropriate or the best use of those technologies. I used a case study um, in uh, Australia and working with uh, researchers in Laos. They were agricultural researchers. Now, this is in the ACR sense, Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, if you don't know it, their sense of agriculture. That includes fisheries and forestry as well. Okay. I did it in two sections. First thing I had to do was actually work out how teams, international teams, remembering that international agricultural research teams need, um, include rather, people from various aspects of a project. They might be people who are involved in the technical side of the agriculture. There'll be the extension officers. There'll be Australians. In our case here, there'll be Laos. There may be other institutions, other um, groups working with you. There may be people from uh, IRI, if we're in Southeast Asia, from the International Rice Research Institute. There could be, and they'll be from different cultures. They'll have different backgrounds. They'll have different education systems. And these all in impact 
on the communication that happens within those teams. And it's actually amazing. It's basically never been done before in the world that someone actually got down and had a look at and asked people how they talk to each other in these teams. There has been some observation work done uh, in Africa, but there's never anything but really been done to get down to the nitty gritty of it, of how it was actually done. First part was to, to develop a model, and the second part decided to take it a step further, and because so much of our, ice, of our communication these days is done on computers, using various programs, we, I wanted to have a look at whether, given these uh, ideas or models of communication, whether the actual programs that we use, the mobile phones we use, are they appropriate? Do they actually work with the groups of people um, who we're looking at? And then um, I want to finish off today with a little bit of a look at um, some of the conclusions that I came up with and hopefully a couple of takeaways for yourself um, and a bit of a look at few possible future research that could arise from it and which I'm investigating currently. Okay, this one is not going to be too much of a, a too much thinking for yourself. Um, I think you're all, uh, so many of you have, have been in the past involved or are, or are currently involved with uh, some form of research that involves international groups. Um, for Southeast Asia, it's vital for uh, development in those countries, particularly as so many of those countries, such as Laos and Cambodia, are so dependent on rural development. Um, it's been shown time and time again that communication is vital in addressing not just agricultural uh, development, development, but also rural poverty. Um, and one of the real bases for good communication is effective relationships within research teams, particularly in building mutual trust and respect. And it's also been shown that cultural differences within those teams has, a very, has quite a big influence um, on the communication that happens within international teams. Now these ones were particularly looking at broader um, scientific teams and most research has actually been done in business. So much of what I drew on theoretically was out of, business, was, was out of global business teams. And um, there's been a lot of stuff done there and in fact one of the main theories um, that I drew on was, was straight out of international business communication. Okay, in the area of the ICTs or the information and computer technologies used in agricultural communication, nowadays, particularly where we have dispersed teams, as in our case where I looked at between Australia and Laos, or Lao PDR, um, there has been a, quite a bit of research, a lot of research done rather, in looking at how dispersed teams work together. Again, that's been mainly in business and IT industries. Um, and there, in recent years, there has been a real push to get more and more ICTs involved in, um, uh, in uh, communication in agriculture. And I think a great example is in ACR, the uh, push there in the use of mobile tech technologies in their projects has been um, really pushed for the last five years. There's been a number of theories that have come in, uh, have grown up mainly within the ICT, uh, in the uh, IT industry, in the information te technology industry, about how people choose ICTs to use in projects or with other people. Um, but it's amazing how little has been done that actually takes into account different cultures. It's only the last five years they've actually started looking at how we talk to each other using um, uh, various information technology. So, what did I do? 
I looked at, firstly, phase one was this exploratory study. As I said, it had never been done before in agriculture or in uh, particularly the natural sciences and biological sciences. It had not been done. So I was starting from scratch. So I decided to go down a qualitative methodology uh, to try and just work out what even affects uh, the communications between these people. So there's my overall research question. Uh, is how do agricultural scientists in Southeast Asia communicate in collaborative research teams? I might also add their dispersed teams. So that means they're located in both Australia and Laos. And then I looked at some of the really basic things about the communication that happens within those teams. What modes are used? What factors help? and hinder that communication and what could be done to improve that communication. To do that, I used 30 interviews uh, in both Australia and Lao PDR. Uh, I used a key informant snowball technique. That was, I got to the end of a, of a set of questions that I had, what they call a semi-structured uh, interview schedule got to the end of them and I said, OK, you've just done this interview, which took about an hour to do. Um, who would you ask? Name me three people who you would now ask uh, these questions to. Who do you think I should go and ask these questions to? And they would go bang, bang, bang. And what I did is I worked from Australia. I started at ACR, worked my way through ACR, a uh, number of interviews there. Then I moved out here. Um, and did some interviews uh, around uh, southern New South Wales. Uh, and then, in, that was especially in CSU. And then I moved to uh, Lao and worked with uh, uh, the Lao. That was, uh, I think I did 12 in Australia. I did six what I call bridges, who are people who join between Australians and Lao. Link, link them together, and then another 12 Lao, and a couple of others as well. So it was quite uh, an, ex uh, an expanse of uh, experience and types of people. We'll get onto that in a minute, who they were. As I said, one hour, most of them were face to face, except for two at the very end, who I actually couldn't get to because one was in Sweden and one was in somewhere lost in Vietnam. Um, and so um, I had to do those by email. Um, all of the interviews were transcribed um, by myself. They were all recorded by myself. Um, and then a, a, a qualitative uh, analysis done using gravity theory methodology. Um, that, it was very, very um, comprehensive in the amount of work I had to do, that took quite a while because I had to do the whole lot. It was, took quite a while to do. But I think what came out of it was actually very useful. <coughs> they were the types of people I interviewed. Uh, interestingly, they were mostly male. And remember the methodology I used was snowballing, where I asked who should I go and ask next. So that was interesting. And that was both Australians and Lao. Uh, they were mostly masters and PhDs, so they did have a, re a, a good level of education. Um, as I said, they were right across the spectrum of uh, agricultural and rural development. Um, the location, they were widespread. Uh, the expatriates were not just Australian, by the way, too. There were other nationalities, too, particularly European. Um, employers, there were a range of employers from ACR, from international uh, groups. Hi Alison, you're late, where's your note? <laughs> um, all the way through to uh, universities, um, government research groups, all sorts. Um, and a variety of positions, except for I did have, I did miss out on the lower tier of researchers as well, and 
that I point out as a bit of a limitation. And that was mainly a time and resources problem. I just couldn't um, do the lot. Okay, main results. Firstly, I just want to do some of the, the modes that they use, and this is not going to be any surprise for anyone who's worked in uh, developing countries. Face to face is still number one. It cannot be beaten. I think what was interesting, but for the Lao, is they placed particularly the greatest importance on the national project meetings, those annual meetings where you bring up or review the year's activities. They really found those most important. The other thing they loved was the field visits, as did the bulk of the Australians too. They were very, very important, and you'll see, uh, we'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. Um, except to say that those field visits did fulfilled a very important role in forming personal relationships, not just professional relationships. And the personal relationships were, were most important for the Lao. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, but I do know some people who feel uncomfortable from Australia who feel uncomfortable with that. And there, I, there was a, that came out in the interviews as well. Not everyone is comfortable in also forming those, those personal relationships. And the Lao, just about to a T, said, we love them. They're so important to our communication. In the te technology, their number one was EMA. By far. Now, why? In theory, with ICT, uh, in the IT theories, um, they say that email has got the worst amount of what we call non-verbal cues, or what I'm doing now, flashing hands, eye contact, facial expressions. That it has got the worst um, transmission of non-verbal cues, and yet, it is their preferred one. And these are people with experience with Skype too. So, and the reason is, anyone might have hazard a guess? It worked. Yeah, no, I don't uh, it worked. Right. <laughs> Absolutely. <coughs> and you've got written evidence of, you know, the conversation. Yeah, that was so one. You've got it there. You need to take extra notes, you know. Exactly. exactly. And particularly when you're working with cultures where they need evidence, for their bosses, thinking of political environment here, the, that was one very important thing, um, was to have written evidence of interviews, what was said, and as a, as a formal recording. So what would happen, would happen is someone might do a phone call, but then they would back it up with an email to make sure that everyone got it right about what was said. So email was very good in that way. But their number one thing was language. And that was their number one barrier in communication was language. English particularly, top of the list was technical English. And nearly up with the uh, top of the list with technical English was the Australian accent. They have so much trouble and I think our international friends here would agree that the Australian accent bloody hard. And it's a very, it's something that I, I know I've had to learn to do it. I actually change my act, I try to change my speech patterns when I'm talking in international situations. Were your interviews in Mao in English? No, and that's an interesting one. The reason I did it in English only was that the main communication language for international teams is English. And I wanted to ask questions in the context in which they worked. I could have done that, and that's actually one of my things for future research. I would love to get some of these interviews done in Laos. I think we would get some, we could get some different results. But I think it was important, just as an initial um, start for this model, was to 
um, get it done in English and see how they could react. They had no problems. It was very interesting. Most of them had no problems in talking and giving their opinions in English. I filled up one hour plus every time. Did they have any issues with ethics? Like with, like um, I had to be very careful with uh, with uh, anonymity. Mm -hmm. Never say that word. Um, and we made sure that our interviews were always done in either a public place or in a public where it could be seen. And the reason for that is, is to show that I've got nothing to hide. Um, one of my best places for doing them were coffee shops. I did a lot of interviews in coffee shops. Drank far too much coffee loud, but that's another story. <coughs> Okay, now other ICTs they used were uh, down here, they were all ones listed uh, and they used them fairly regularly. Skype was one, interestingly, the Lao used quite a bit, but only with their mates. And they very rarely used it for work and there was a good reason for that. Well, uh, that's mainly to do with bandwidth in, at work. In private, they had plenty of bandwidth. In fact, if you go along the Mekong Valley and you look from Laos across to Thailand, you all you see is microwave dishes all the way along the river bank for hundreds of miles. And why? Because all the Thai companies have got the mobile tied up. And it all goes up into the hills and they've got the best coverage of mo best mobile coverage I've ever seen. 98% of the country is covered in mobile. They're, they can get mobiles. I've heard a story of a guy way up in the mountains up near the Chinese border getting run by his wife to say, where's the fish for tonight's dinner? You bought some before you left, didn't you? And he said, I can't go anywhere. She follows me. Okay, some of the differences. Um, I've already sort of mentioned this second one, but the first one, the Australians were most important to them, just about to a T bar one, was mutual trust and respect. It was their main thing that they wanted to get with communication. And that was also the main constraint. Is there mutual trust and respect between us as professionals to be able to communicate with? But the Laos said, it's language. Us as native speakers, how many of us will, uh, know or work in a language of the group that we're working with? I don't. I feel, I feel quite humbled when I travel overseas and I hear people who have got two, three, four, five languages. Um, in addition, I've already mentioned this one about forming prof uh, personal friendships as well as professional relationships. Cultural differences is wrapped up with that. And there's also structural issues. We've also, we've already mentioned this bandwidth problem for Skype. Uh, in, some, uh, in some workplaces, they don't actually have enough bandwidth at the time of day that you need to contact people in Skype. It, in some countries, uh, some developing countries now, that's improving. Uh, I know, for example, in Pakistan, that's started to improve, and that Skype's being used much more in international research there. Um, in Laos, I noticed that, but that people, personally, they would have their own personal accounts, particularly on Wi-Fi, and they would be um, hooking into Skype to get to speak to their cousins living overseas quite happily. So it's there, the technology there, the knowledge is there. It's just that various workplaces don't have it. I think that's improved a little bit in um, uh, particularly Nafri, um, which is their main research institute just outside of Vientiane. Um, I think that's improved recently, and that's part of the reason. I'd love to go back to Laos to have a look at that.
to uh, see. Well, it's kind of stuff that, it, when you say personal friendships, you mean like what level? Swapping children's stories, liking on Facebook, yep. going to dinner parties? Yep. Going and having a game of petonk and a beer on a Friday afternoon after work is the number one way you can speak to a researcher in Laos. Does it sound hard? It's not hard. <laughs> Very enjoyable. I don't talk much. You get great interviews. It's amazing. A couple of beer loud, you get great interviews. And don't win. <laughs> don't win. Wear it on. Uh, particularly Patong. Yeah. But that's that's what I mean. Just going that step further. Uh, one interview. One interview. He said before he left to go come back to Australia, they'd had a bit of time, and they went and had a barbecue with goat. And he sat down with them and had a goat barbecue. With some kids on the barbecue. And he said that did so much for his relationships with that group the next time he came back. It was really important. Okay, out of all this, I developed a model for, um, for communication between uh, various groups. It was based on the barriers that are set up between different groups within research team and also um, what can help or hinder? And I, you'll see what I mean. To get that effective team communication. There's some of these, what I call moderators. So there's personal attributes. Your friendliness. Your um, empathy for another culture. Your interest in another culture. They are really important for communication. Uh, cultural intelligence is what you actually know about that culture that helps you in your work. For, you know, for example, the fact that this is a one-party state. I have to work within that. There are certain constrictions in freedom of communication when you work in a one-party state. You've got to recognise that and you've got to understand when a, when a researcher says, look, I can't talk about that, or goes on to a completely different topic, knowing that they can't talk about it. And that's much more likely. And you've got to recognise that. Sometimes, as I've mentioned before, you could get a bridge or a broker that links the two groups together, link the Lao and the Australians. And they may be people who, as an Australian who's an expatriate who's lived in Lao for 30 years, married to a Lao, sometimes Thai uh, wife. Lao and Thai, by the way, are very, uh, quite close language-wise, not culturally, but language-wise. Um, Lao is, they won't, sometimes there's a bit of conjecture about this, but uh, Lao is uh, said to be a dialect of Thai, but don't get in the way of that one. <laughs> Um, so you'll get these bridges can help communication, but they can also hinder. Uh, there's an example of a guy, uh, one who, one person who was a bridge who had commented on a uh, one of the um, ICT sites, one of the discussion sites about a particular aspect of herbal medicine in Lao, and the Lao came back and said, "No, no, no, that's totally wrong." It's not that at all. And this is a guy who lived there for 30 years, and they said, oh, we don't listen to him anyway. So much is a bridge, so much for bridging and brokering. Yeah. So it can be a little bit of a, a problem as well. These are the constraints that I found. Temporal, meaning time differences. No, we've got a four hour time difference just now between here and Laos. That does constrict the working day. And what it is, is basically you've got to learn what their start and finish times are and try and, everyone's got to work together to try and get in, into those different times. Uh, cultural differences, the difference between um, um, an Australian and a Lao has been looked at um, in literature in a uh, cultural relations literature quite a bit, but it's not all he's allowed, therefore he works that way, you're an Australian, therefore you work that way. It's not like that. There are, there's differences along a continuum. 
and that's been shown as well in recent, in more recent years. Wait, so where does uh, gender differences or gender issues come into? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, the gender differences, um, it was particularly I found, uh, because I interviewed mostly yeah, right. males, but the uh, females I did interview, there was a few. Now, there's less in Laos. I'd be interested to take this to other countries where um, different political and cultural um, setups will have, and I think Pakistan's a great example of that, where there, is a, there are differences in, uh, between gender, in particularly in the communication. Um, us as Australians as di of different, uh, di di different genders, as well as the people we're working with. Yeah. Um, so there was some of that, but not as much as you, you might get with other cultures. Uh, geographic distance, just the very, the very fact that we can't talk here, you and me now, like this every day, is very different in when you're working in international teams. Political differences we've already touched on. Language difference, uh, the use of the English language, particularly technical English. Um, this is uh, why I mentioned before fields, uh, field visits. That's why they would love field visits. Because you can talk te te technical stuff, but pick it up and show them. You know, you pick up a weed, you pick up, you show a, a particular livestock disease. And they could pick that, and if you use the English technical terms as you're talking about it, they go, Ah, that makes sense. And that was a far more important way of communication for me. Um, online infrastructure we've already talked about. Economic power sort of rela is related to uh, online infrastructure in that the amount of money that's available to get that bandwidth going. And this is something that the Lao have been uh, uh, trying to tackle, particularly in agricultural research. Now, some other moderators that are in there. There's institutional context. The very fact that you're working with Graham Centre, ACR, NAFRI, and National University of uh, Laos, that adds a whole new layer of complexities apart from just Australia and Laos PDR. So you've got all those institutions. You've got inter-organisational uh, inter context, particularly when you're working across some organisations, um, national and international organisations, uh, like ERI. Uh, some countries feel quite um, constrained and quite intimidated by those big, those big organisations. And the international context we've also, we've already been uh, talking more about. Okay. I took that model of communication um, and from that I built a tool and um, have tested this tool now um, using the information I got out of these interviews. I built a tool to try and see if what people say they want out of their communication and the barriers to that communication, how does that, you know, how does that influence the ICTs they use. Do the ICTs do the job that they want, that these people want? So, that was my research question. How well do the ICTs meet the communication needs of team members? I used um, the, those fault lines, those barriers. I used those to develop eight, and the ICT people know uh, all about this one, is intercultural heuristics to do heuristic evaluation. You'll see what that means in a minute, um, particularly in the results when you see that section. And they are basically a set of questions that you can interrogate a particular piece of software and says, does it do these jobs? Yes or no? I also added another set of 10. These are very well known, very well used ones in the IT industry about how to assess uh, different programs. It's particularly when they're building a program, they, they apply these general heuristics done by Nielsen here, 
um, they apply those to their uh, programs as they're building them. So they can try and find problems and sort them before they hit the commercial market. So this is used a lot in the uh, commercial industry, in the uh, commercial IT, uh, IT industry. I combine them into a, this um, intercultural combined heuristic evaluation tool. I'll call it iCheck, because it's a little lot shorter. And then I looked at nine ICTs, which we've already listed. Um, I looked at those nine ICTs and applied this uh, tool to those um, ICTs. Um, how I built the tool, um, if you come along uh, to a, a conference which I have to be going to later this year, you'll be able to hear all about it. I'll have to go to Washington DC to fill it. Okay, this is what these heuristics look like. The 10 general ones of Nielsen, they measure what's called utility, or does it do what it say it's going to do? Does it have, you know, can you get the, vis the visibility of the system's uh, status? Does it match um, this, uh, the system, does the system actually match what's happening in the real world? Um, is there, are users able to ch um, control it and have some freedom in using it? And so on. I think you can read those. I then, these were the uh, heuristics that I developed that took into account how well different users using, used it. So this is both Australians and Lao. Okay, we're looking at the communication between those groups. So, the language, particularly the amount of English that was used, and whether other languages could be used. Um, did, did it address um, graphic, uh, geographic and temporal distance? Um, did it encourage interpersonal relations, which was seen as a really important thing in our model? Um, did it allow specific cultural cues to be transmitted as part of the ICT? all the way down to, could it actually be used in that country? Really interesting, when I very first started doing the research, um, Skype couldn't be used in ACI. Because they were having a, pro a problem at the time, they actually restricted all access to Skype. So that was one problem, tick, um, for um, the Skype, for the use of Skype. In this, uh, in international agricultural research, is that a problem with Skype or a problem with ACI? It was a problem with ACI at the time. So this is a user problem, the usability. Okay, this is an example of how I actually. Uh, this is uh, of the tool. This is one question. Um, I asked, did it? Con uh, did it? Um, did this particular uh, ICT, say Skype, um, could the users overcome geographic and time barriers between uh, team members? And then these particular questions were ones I developed. Now these questions were developed out of past research particularly, or out of the, um, the interviews that I did. Okay. This is what I found. The red ones are ones uh, that are the red flags. They are what's called high conformance. They are non-compliant or have high non-conformance. Uh, non they are the problem ones. In the use of, in according to these general uh, heuristics. Now. I might add too, when I looked at websites, I also looked at the ACR website versus the NAFRI, that's the National Agricultural Forest Research Institute in uh, Laos, and so they've got different cultural influences there. The green ones were the lowest, uh, were compliant, they had the lowest non-compliance, and the light green were in between. So you could see I didn't want to, um, particularly as this was a, a qualitative um, study, I'm not out to try and say, put a number on it. 
okay? But I am out there to show some of the problems. <coughs> okay, so that was the general heuristics. This is what I've found from our, uh, from the intercultural heuristics from, uh, that arose out of the uh, model. You could see Skype had a few problems. Email, none. The NAFRI site was really interesting. They had uh, things in there to, uh, for example, translate between Lao and English, only they were broken. That didn't work. Um, readiness, uh, that was the readiness to use. Legal adaptability, um, some of them were much more legally up and running straight away. Um, and that's, that problem with ACR comes up there. <coughs> So it's interesting in that many things that we take for granted have actually got a few problems. Now, again, if you want to have a look at exactly what I found, um, please see me later. I've got my uh, thesis here and I can show you um, some of the uh, actual work. Okay. Combining the work that I did with those in assessing all those ICTs and also with the um, some of the interviewees' comments. I've sort of combined them to give a few takeaway messages, I suppose, um, for ourselves at, at who, who work in international teams. A really important part of email was the asynchronicity or the ability to be able to send the message, stop, look at it, send the message back. The big thing was the stop and look at it, particularly for people for whom English is a second language. If they've got time to go off, go into their boss and say, hey, what's this mean? How do, you, how do I, or to get their message and say, hey, is this the right way to say this? Could I say this better? Is this what I'm trying to say? Anybody use language translation software? There was only two ICTs that use language translation software. One of them, in, in, interestingly, was Skype in their instant messaging. But it's only at 60%. So that means the other 40% is mistakes. How, how good that is in a communication <laughs> sense, I'll leave that, I'll leave that to you. I, I, I tried doing it, particularly I've got a son living in uh, Taiwan. And he sends me stuff in Mandarin. It's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, because I send it back to him, the translation, and he, he has a giggle too. Um, yeah, and some of these comments are interesting. These are both from Lao um, researchers. Um, and again, I used anonymity there, so all the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Um, and they all, they all mention this link back to English and the importance of the ICTs for English and how particularly email helped them. And this is why email was particularly important for that. Email also provided a number of really good um, um, features that really suited teams in teamwork. You could send out a general broadcast, you could send it out as an individual one, according to your needs. Um, and in that way, email was very handy, particularly with, att with attachments. They loved them. Anything that, that they could send an attachment was great. However, email was poor for building trust. And this comes back to the Australians, who were looking to build respect and trust. And this is why there is that thing about using email in our cultures, in Western cultures, um, there is that thing, does email help build mutual trust and respect, which is our needs. Wes, can you, I'm surprised by that because mm. in my experience I use email to build trust mm. because you, know, you might be working with a, a leader in an institution that who you CC into that email is effectively your is increasing that, yeah, exactly. And so yeah. 
when you include them on CC them on an email that's going to the director, they think, wow, this guy really trusts yeah. us. That, yeah, yeah. Mm. That's an, it, it is an interesting one, and it varies with cultures yeah, yeah. on how that's seen. There is a, a face thing, because what you could be doing is actually putting off the director. Because he says, I'm above, I'm above that person. How come you're yeah, in, in the hierarchy? Yeah, yeah. Better be CC next time. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that builds trust. Yeah. 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 That's what B stands for, the yeah. yeah. building. Yeah. 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 And, and that's a really yeah. interesting question, and this is the whole thing. But, but the, the thing of actually doing your emails in the first place, did you start with that person with an email? Oh, I or did you meet them? Oh, no, I know them. No. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's a big thing. Probably what's important is it's sort of relative to other ways of, of the communication, and people think that email doesn't build as much trust than face to face. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the really important things that brings out is that it's not just about email or not, not just much. about Skype. It's the whole lot mm -hmm. coming together mm -hmm. and how we use all these various tools to build trust, to get over language barriers, to get all, over all these barriers. And one of the important things, I, and I think you said that I already knew them, yeah. did you meet them face to face beforehand? Yeah. 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 And that's so important. And this comes out in literature too, that's so important to do that initial meeting face to face, build the relationship, even if it's just to start with a professional relationship, but remembering that you're going to have this pull to also do a personal relationship to, from certain cultures. So that face to face cannot be emphasised enough, I don't think. But there is, um, there is um, evidence coming through that that's changing a little bit in some places, particularly in advanced countries, where, they, where we've been using it for a lot longer. So it's, it, it's, in the, it's in a flux. Okay, another thing that really came out was that, that poor, poor IT uh, infrastructure and available bandwidth, and we don't just mean in Laos, because their mobile is fantastic. They've, they've got, you know, their um, um, holes are nowhere big as our holes in our coverage. Um, but, it, and, you know, our bandwidth can be pretty poor in regional Australia too, in places. So I think all organisations need to take that into account. As I've said, as, a, as, as Gabriel uh, pointed out. And also a couple of other problems that were not noted in the first phase of the exploratory, but I did see in the second phase, was there was very little support for not uh, for non-English speaking users. There was very few had help um, manuals in other languages, other than English. It is so English centric, um, and. The variable adaptability, it's so, you know, every culture's got their own ways of using these things. And it's so variable across cultures. And it's, um, yeah, it was, it was a very interesting uh, process to go through. Okay, I also question the, ref, uh, the relevance of a number of uh, the Nielsen heuristics, the general ones, particularly when you start looking at things like websites. I don't know if uh, anyone's seen Korean or Chinese websites. Every whiz and bang that you can get on a page is going to be showing up on those websites. And they are very appropriate for those cultures, for what they're looking for. And, and then they look at, an, at the ACR website, pretty boring. Okay? And yet, we'll have, I've heard only recently the same complaint of people talking about a Chinese. I can't read it because it's all whizzing and turning and sliding and all this sort of thing. Really interesting. Okay, conclusions. In-person communication is still the number one. We're not going to get away from that. 
And when we're looking at funding, <coughs> our research, our research proposals, it has to take that into account. We've got to have our, still have our travel budgets. No matter what anyone says, Skype is not the be all and end all. Um, when working overseas, a couple of things that might be important. Um, technical English. Uh, one thing I heard about recently is the growth of uh, technical Lao uh, English dictionaries. And Khmer, I understand there's a new Khmer one just come out too. Cannot underestimate the value of those. Um, uh, the need for personal and professional relationships working in some cultures. And that was very, uh, very obvious in Laos. The importance of face. Uh, I haven't mentioned that in the, part, in the past, except down to these cultural differences. But face is very important for Asian, East Asian cultures. The, the maintenance of someone's dignity in their eyes and in, their, in, and in the eyes of their compatriots, their colleagues. And that's got a bit to do with the hierarchy thing I think we were talking about before as well. Um, this might be another PhD question, but how did, how did that go with the importance of face, with the fact that we're sort of providing them with money for this research in that's the first... That's a whole lovely did, new question. <laughs> did that get <clears throat> come up at all, the fact that it's already yeah. kind of top down in a way, even if it's bottom up in terms of the sort of... The economic development which was tied, I did tie to um, bandwidth and that sort of thing. In a broader sense, the economic development, yes. Uh, where that did come out was particularly with the relative differences in pay scales between local research, between Lao researchers and Australian mm. researchers. Because it must be a big issue of saving face when we're actually coming in there to provide them with stuff which I'm assuming is because they can't do it themselves. There must be some conflict in that yeah. space. Skills and experience are probably the biggest things that we've got to give, as well as the money, because now the amount of money that's been dragged out of um, government budgets to do other things and away from agricultural research means that more and more some countries are depending on international research for their basic research for that, for that country. And I saw, I saw it a number of times. They said they complained about we needed to get keep the international research going to be able to fund our basic research that we take day for day. And it was pretty, yeah, it was harsh. Um, okay, and one of the last things I, I looked at was also. Okay, we've got all we've done. Had a look at all these ICTs. How do they all fit together? How can we use them? Um, how can we fit them to do specific tasks that we need to do in a uh, research project? And that take into account all of these constraints: geography, culture, economic development, bandwidth. For example, I built something like that. So looking at what you wanted to do, what might be the choice of ICT that best fits that job. Okay, you might recognise some of those. You might say, hmm, maybe I shouldn't do that one. Maybe I, or maybe I might give this a crack. Okay, and remembering things like, you know, record of meeting. Allow love that because it made sure that they would, they got on track and that they had that proof to the boss. So and, if, and if they haven't understood the conversation, they can read it, read it, it, it later. They can read it, or they can go and get a friend to come and say, "What does this mean?" Yeah. Okay, future research. I really want to go and confirm that this works. I've done it here in Australia. I've done it as a Farang looking from the outside. I really would love to get a, at least one collaborator, a collaborator in Laos, uh, and we can work together on the lab, particularly in the Laos, uh, further in the Laos side. Um, 
looking further, particularly into age hierarchy, online infrastructure in country, uh, and the and how the English language has changed. Uh, in, in, interesting thing is, in about '93 was when Lao came out of from behind the Iron Curtain or the Bamboo Curtain as it was then, into a into ASEAN. Uh, the Australian, uh, the um, Asian South, uh, Association of Southeast Asian Nations, of which, by the way, English is the communicating language, the official communicating language. So they joined ASEAN, and with that, they started going to all the international um, organisations and the international meetings and realised they needed to learn English. They didn't get a lot of English behind the Iron Curtain. Interestingly, but some did say that they first learned English in Russia. So they had great Russian accents in their, in their English. As did some of them have American, Japanese, you know. Um, I would love to also look at, as I think I've already said, love to do those interviews in Lao and see what the differences that come out of that. But that also adds the added complexities of transcribing, translating, back translating, all that sort of thing. And I'd like to get at least two evaluators in Lao to have a look at iChip and to look at these different ICTs through their eyes and also under their conditions. So in their, with their bandwidth, with their access, that sort of thing. Thank you.